Recording on this computer should work. <laughs> all right, so today's lecture is a little bit late. Uh, I am sure all of you read the Rust book already. So, that, you know, uh, doing introduction to Rust would be sort of a little bit of a refresher. Uh, so what I did is we do have a bit of a refresher, but I want us to kind of not learn Rust from the basics, but kind of reflect of what Rust offers and also kind of a show you a little bit of what is expected out of you in the exam. So I have some uh, some things which are sort of a hinting what you can expect from the exam. To pass the course, of course, you have to pass the obliques, then you are assessed by the portfolio, and then you have to pass the exam. Um, this is kind of an interesting topic because we observed uh, that first semester students were told not to use ChatGPT and Copilot, but to sort of do the small exercises themselves. Um, and when you're learning a kind of programming, when you're learning new language, you're starting with very simple things, like, you know, two liners, three liners, and those are perfectly solvable by ChatGPT. So it's tempting just to have the Copilot filling, fill up all your um, code for you. Uh, but if you're doing that, you're not actually acquiring some of the skills that you should. Uh, and it resulted in the first semester students having a massive uh, failure rate in the exam. So we didn't see it ever before. It was 50% in the first semester, they failed uh, Froder's course, right? It's like, oh my God. And it's a course which is a foundation for everything else. So you cannot take any, like a lot of other courses because you failed Grundlage programming, right? So then it's like a, a major, major problem. Um, so um, it's a little bit similar in this course because in the exam, you will be told to do certain things and you kind of need to remember the syntax. So if you've been using Copilot, it's like, shit, like how do I do a struct? in Rust, right? Is it like name first and struct after? No, that was in Golang maybe, or I don't remember, right? So if you were not typing stuff yourself, you will actually have hard time remembering like what the, the syntax is. Uh, so I'm just warning you that in the exam, there is no chat GPT and you will have to write your own stuff yourself, right? Um, so I know it's um, negotiable in a sense that do we really need to have those skills? Uh, I am actually not sure, right? So I'm not sure if we really need to have the skills of remembering the syntax, but at the moment, it is kind of expected that you actually do have those skills. When you're having job interviews and things like that, you are giving a piece of paper and you have to do something and there is no chat GPT helping you, right? Uh, that's the reality. Maybe in a couple of years, they will give you a laptop with chat GPT and they will ask you to do something with it. But at the moment, that's not the case, right? So if you're looking for a job, you actually have to remember the syntax yourself. Um, so that's what we teach and that's what we assess in the exam. Uh, we may change it if the industry changes and everybody's doing interviews with chat GPT enabled, <laughs> fine. We will change our exams as well, but the situation is what it is today, and that's how it is. And it is a little bit tough. Um, it's not like if you were using Copilot uh, and you actually know the language, it takes a little bit of a refresher to kind of uh, re recall the syntax. Like, you know, I I kind of uh, need to do that um, when I'm switching from Rust to Golang or something. Like the syntax is different and you kind of need to get back to that syntax. Um, but it's not the hard work, like it takes a couple of days maybe. You just practice a little bit and then you will remember it, right? So syntax is one thing. The second thing is functions. Uh, so how you get ahead of the list in, in, in Haskell? Well, if you have to look that up, you're in a bit of a trouble, right? Um, how do you map or fold in Rust? Okay, it's called map or fold dot, right, okay? Um, if, if you've been using it yourself, you will remember it. But if the copilot was doing it for you all the time, then you may actually not remember that the, the map function in Rust is called map, um, although it's kind of obvious. Uh, but my, my point is that you kind of need to make yourself a bit of a cheat sheet with the core functions that are sort of useful, right? Like you don't look up how to do for loop in C, right? You sort of know for loop is for blah, 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 right? So there are certain things like 
head, tail, uh, map, fold, filter, all those kind of uh, fundamental things. You sort of need to remember how, how, how they are spelled and how you use them. Um, anything fancy, anything very complex, we don't expect you to kind of memorize. That thing you can look up with the, um, with the docs. But the fundamental things you sort of need to remember. I probably will make some uh, cheat sheet in the exam with some of the functions that I expect you to use, um, which you may or may not have remembered. So that the cheat sheet will be part of the exam, uh, especially if you were to use some monadic constructs. Um, so I can give you the function and the signature and what it does and for Haskell, and then you sort of should incorporate it, right? Uh, but some, like I will not tell you that Haskell has head and tail, right? That That is expected that you remember. All right, so let's move on uh, a little bit into the discussion of, um, of Rust. But the first thing is what is causing you the most trouble with Haskell? Yes, we do have some cheat sheets um, in Git, but in the exam, you you are kind of in Inspera and you, the browser is limited and you don't have access to things. And um, you will not be allowed to bring aids to the exam. So like on the only aids you will have are the ones which are in the exam itself. Syntax. <laughs> yeah, so th that is quite funny actually, because I think the syntax is the thing that I love the most about Haskell. Um, so if, if I'm doing something else and I have to go back to Haskell, I don't have to refresh the syntax. But every time I go into Golang or to Rust, I have to refresh the syntax. And I never remember the syntax in Rust. I never remember if you do like a two columns and square or you go, go square directly or like syntax in Rust is so complex that I always have to look it up. Like what, 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 what is it? Uh, in Haskell, no syntax. I, I don't think it, it is, it's actually super, um, super friendly. <laughs> but this is true. Like if you're coming from C, Java, C++, C Sharp, it's really different, right? Uh, so of course it's very different, but once you learn it, it's like, I don't know. For me, it's the other way around. Um, yeah, the applicatives, um, thinking differently. Yeah, so that, th those are valid points. Uh, and that's what I hope the course and the exercises which we had were kind of helping you. They were helping you to think slightly differently and they were helping you to kind of think about the problem slightly differently, uh, but it takes time. And um, so some of you, like when we checking the labs, they say, oh, I love fold. I'm solving everything with fold. And some of you are like, I hate fold. I don't understand like how to use it and how it works, right? Um, so, you know, you, you kind of try to find yeah, a tool for a job. <laughs> so we had a discussion yesterday about it as well. Um, you can solve everything with for loops, but sometimes that is kind of ugly looking complex code. Sometimes you should use kind of a more functional uh, constructs like maps or, or, or folds. Um, yeah, so some of the concepts are kind of hard. I get that. Any problems with um, not having actual um, loops in the language? Was that causing a problem? Not really. Recursive or the, the collection kind of uh, functions, they are super useful. All right. So,
Why do you think we teach C, C++, Golang, Haskell, and Rust? So it's true that the selection is from uh, languages that are actually relevant in the market. Uh, although some people may question Haskell, uh, that it's not as relevant as the other ones uh, in the marketplace. Uh, but the relevance in the, the, the marketplace, that it's there. Why don't we teach uh, Python or C Sharp, for example? very specific to companies and to your um, like fields. Yeah, but do, do you feel, do you really need kind of a training in Python, for example, or can you just start using it if you have to? And I can just stop using it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the reason why we kind of don't teach Python, but then in the AI course, you're sort of using it. Uh, is because it's so uh, easy to get into it that we don't have to teach you that. You can teach it yourself, right? Yeah. So if, well, why are the computer science students there learning Java when you can kind of learn the Java if you learn C? They don't learn C++ uh, and they have Java instead of C in the fundamental programming course. Um, and the choice is somewhat... Um, it, it is a good question, but I think it's a mistake, right? So I, I think Java is a good language to know, but it's easier to learn Java if you know C and C++ than to learn C, C++ if you know Java. So the transition, like if you were to become a programmer, is easier from C, C++ to Java than other way around. Uh, because uh, C, C++ kind of uh, exposes you to all the concepts which Java doesn't have necessarily. Um, so this is why we don't teach Java or C Sharp straight away, but you sort of can pick it up later. And they are relevant in the marketplace as well, but they are kind of uh, easier to pick up with the base that you have from C, C++ and, um, and Rust, right? Um, why they don't, I, I honestly don't know. There was a, there was a shift. Uh, so up till 2000, um, most universities were teaching C, C++. And then Java came along. They, it became kind of a wide, widely acknowledged success language. It was simplifying a lot of development. It had less memory problems than C++ and so on. And many universities switched. So there was kind of a hype, which maybe between 2000 and 2015, everybody was actually teaching Java as a fundamental programming language and C, C++ went kind of, uh, the people were thinking that this kind of a low level languages will kind of uh, slowly be a niche languages. They will kind of uh, disappear from the marketplace. It, that, it didn't happen. So C and C++ strength kind of maintained the same level. They didn't kind of uh, went down and many universities went back to teaching them as a kind of a core fundamental courses, but many universities stayed. So uh, in the data engineer, they stayed with Java, but I'm not sure it's, it's it's a good choice. And definitely I don't think Python is a good choice, right? So now again, there is a kind of a hype that Python became so popular and a lot of um, fundamental programming courses are based on Python. And I think that's great for non-programmers. It's really good to have like uh, Python skills if you're doing anything else but software development. But if you kind of become um, uh, mm, if you become a professional, you sort of need to know more than knowing Python. And then Python kind of overlooks, kind of hides a lot of complexity from you. Um, so Haskell and Rust are terrible languages. I agree. <laughs> They are difficult. They are really difficult languages. Um, yes, broad range. So that's why you have, you've been exposed to 
kind of a different paradigms and to different languages, some of which you hate, some of which you love, and some of which kind of get, showed you something else. Um, so they are kind of all unique. Uh, that that is the the point. So they are relevant in the marketplace. They have features which are kind of in the in the market, and they are all quite unique. Uh, and you not expected to love all of all of them. Um, all right. So what is Rust? So Rust actually is heavily inspired by Haskell. So if you're coming to Rust from Haskell, a lot of things kind of make sense because it it is kind of conceptually the same concept, right? So the enums. Uh, in, in Rust are not like enums in Java or C++. They are actually like, a, um, um, you know, um, algebraic data types in Haskell. Uh, and once you know the, the type system in Haskell, it's kind of easy to, to understand, oh yeah, enums in Rust are this, this thing that I already know. Um, uh... So there is a question about the exam and uh, let me double check. So exams are kind of weird because they are not really course coordinator um, thing. So school exam be, be all printed and handwritten support material is allowed. Yes, so that's true. So you can actually bring your own cheat sheet. So I will not do that cheat sheet for you. So you can bring your own cheat sheet for the exam. Thanks for spotting that. All right, so then um, Rust offers the kind of the paradigm very similar to Haskell, but with the syntax from C, C++ and with the manual control over memory. So it's really good for embedded systems. It's really good for mobile systems. It's really good for low footprint kind of um, systems, real-time systems, uh, systems that require kind of a detailed control over memory and over processing. Um, so it, it has kind of a really um, um, extremely small footprint if you want it to have small footprint and you are in full control of what the processing will do. So it allows you to control the memory access and memory management yourself. Because of that, there is a certain complexity. So it, there, there is additional things you have to think about and additional kind of uh, constructs that we don't have in Haskell, for example, because the memory management is done by the runtime system for us. And here we're managing everything ourselves. So there are certain things that we need to take care of. Uh, so so it is statically typed. There is no garbage collector. Uh, it has a compile time memory management. What does that mean? It means that um, it doesn't have an active runtime system which manages memory for you in a form of garbage collector or, or some form of um, additional things, but the memory is sort of uh, arranged and checked by the compiler and then the system basically does what the native code is, um, what, what the native code is. Um, there is no in inheritance, so that is also interesting. Um, there has been quite a big hype about object-oriented programming paradigm uh, and people for some time were thinking, yeah, that's the best paradigm there is. Uh, and it turned out that for maintenance and for uh, extensibility and for doing things later with the code bases, uh, inheritance hierarchies were turned out to be a nightmare. So even though it seems like a good idea with the animal and dog and you know this kind of uh, inheritance hierarchies, uh, in practice, it turned out that it causes more problems than help. Um, so some modern languages like Rust, they opted out from inheritance altogether. And instead, what we use instead of inheritance normally, what's the keyword? Parameters. Parameters or? Position. Composition, exactly. So we use composition and delegation. Uh, so you can achieve the same outcome without inheritance using other mechanisms. And those other mechanisms practically are usually better than inheritance chains, right? Um, so there are debates 
like uh, about strands of different paradigms and, and things like this. And there is a lot of arguments for object orientation and object orientation has its place and it has been uh, influential in, in our kind of daily jobs. But as I'm saying, some patterns or some uh, constructs in practice turned out to be more harmful than beneficial. And in like inheritance, uh, especially long kind of a deep nested inheritance turned out to be a problematic. Um, some languages still use it like Java, C Sharp, they are still heavily dependent on inheritance and they are doing certain things following the, the premise of, uh, of um, some of the object oriented patterns, but some languages they, they opted out. So Golang do don't have it. Uh, uh, Rust doesn't have it neither, and Haskell doesn't have it neither. So, um, another thing that is interesting is this mutability on request. So, again, it has been observed that having a mutable state in general, of course, is desirable because you kind of need to mutate your state in your programs, but uh, it also leads to a lot of bugs and it also leads to uh, maintenance nightmares. So uh, languages like um, Kotlin and uh, Rust, they decided that the default is you when you're declaring your variables, you kind of have them immutable, uh, such that you limit the, 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 the damage, you're kind of doing a damage control, right? So where you do need to manipulate your state, you explicitly say, I'm be, I will be manipulating it, but for everything else that you kind of don't need to be mutating, you say, yeah, it's immutable, right? Uh, of course, Haskell is an extreme where everything is immutable and you have to always create new things if you are kind of mutating your state uh, because the state is always immutable. Um, but in Rust, they, they didn't go to that extreme. So they say, yeah, okay, okay, you know, we are, imperative programmers, we will be mutating state, but by default, the initial things that don't need to be mutated will be immutable, right? And then if you do need mutable state, you kind of request it. So it's, it's again, kind of a, a demonstration of side of a, a changes slightly in the paradigms, right? Um, can you have immutable things in C++? Of course you can, but the default is mutable, right? It's the immutability on request. Here, the, it's kind of other way around, right? So mutability on request. Okay, and then what is systems programming? Yep, for example, Linux drivers, OS development, yeah. So, so when when we say systems programming, many people think like kind of a low level uh, programming, kind of close to hardware, close to operating system in the operating system, uh, yeah, low level. Um, but and it's true that that all of this is system systems programming, but systems programming is also kind of a, a little bit higher up, but not on the application layer. So you, you have your kind of a low level um, drivers and everything kind of a close to OS or inside OS. Then you have kind of this middle and then you have applications, right? So when we say application development or application programming language, then we kind of thinking something that touches the user directly. But in the middle, you have a lot of things. You have a lot of libraries, you have a lot of frameworks, you have a lot of support, which are used by the application developers. And this is all systems programming. So all of this is systems programming, right? Um, so it's quite a broad, uh, very um, kind of a fat place in the in the hierarchy, right? Um, of course, at the end, you have this application um, development and application programming. And of course, you can use your systems programming languages there as well, but not all application programming frameworks or um, not frameworks like support or languages are kind of usable here, right? So you probably would not like to use Python here. 
no, <laughs> right? Um, all right, so that's kind of like where Rust fits best. Uh, can you do application development with Rust? Of course you can, uh, but again, like uh, often you have better tools, right? So you can use Rust, you could even use C, but for example, using Java or C Sharp might just make your job much easier, right? On that level. Uh, so sometimes like, yeah, again, uh, it's not definite. Uh, you, you kind of, uh, it, it kind of depends uh, on many factors, but overall, Rust is quite robust and it goes from very low level embedded systems to this kind of a systems programming, right? Yep. Yeah. So backend development is an example of kind of a support um, um, tooling and frameworks and, and services that are used by applications. So that would be sort of uh, in that category as well. Okay, so then uh, the feel of Rust, you all got it already. Uh, it has this kind of a feel of a normal um, C-like uh, programming where you have to use semicolons and colons and uh, square brackets and uh, this, uh, those brackets and curly brackets. So there is a lot of syntax, <laughs> right? So that's what I'm saying about Haskell. In Haskell, you have none of this. <laughs> Right, so the syntax is actually simpler. Uh, there is very um, less to learn. Here, there is quite a lot to learn. Um, again, you have this uh, interesting um, movement towards the types being on the right-hand side, right? So in C, C++, we had the type and then the variable name. Uh, we see from Golang and Rust that they kind of did the, the, the other way around. And it again, it, it comes from practice. It comes from reading a lot of code and, and uh, doing kind of an analysis on how you can compose things. Uh, doing the type up front limits what you can kind of compose and what the resulting thing is. Uh, doing the type on the right allows you to make certain um, syntactic um, um, ergonomic decisions that make, make your reading of the code easier, right? Uh, so for example, I loved the first time I, I, I was learning Golang, I loved the ability to compose kind of a complex things by reading from left to right. So for example, if you are defining a function which takes another function, which takes something of something, 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 you're kind of reading from left to right. Try to write it in C where you have your pointers kind of jumping way to the left. And then like you have to match it with something deep on the right hand side. It's a nightmare, right? So if you were to define something that takes a function, which takes a function in C, of course you can do it, but to read it, it's like a nightmare. I mean, usually it is, it is a nightmare in any language, but in Golang, at least you can lead, read from left to right and it kind of makes sense. In, in C, kind of you cannot. So here you also have types on the, on the right hand side. And they use the colon to kind of uh, denote it, um, which is, yeah, fine, I guess, similar to how Kotlin kind of did that. Uh, and then you can have, um, so, so the initial syntax is um, giving you certain powers and then you get more powers from the macros and the macros don't have to follow the same syntactic uh, constraints of the language. So you can actually do a lot of magic with the macros and they actually do that with the standard library directly as well. So that's where the, the bank comes in. So VEC bank is a macro and then you can do certain tricks, right? Uh, which you cannot normally do with normal syntax. Um, so they kind of extended the expressiveness of the language with this um, macro mechanisms. So there are some resources and then um, a typical um, quiz, kind of uh, you say uh, how hard you perceive those languages. So strongly agree means very hard. Uh, strongly disagree means very easy. And then you place yourself somewhere on the scales.
So of course it's very subjective. Um, I told you before there is a hypothesis which says that if your first language to learn was Haskell, you would think Haskell is the easiest language there is. And if your first language was imperative C or C++, you will think Haskell is the hardest language to learn. Uh, I don't know because we can't go back in time and try that hypothesis, <laughs> but I'm sure because you all mostly came the other way around, you probably perceive Haskell as a hard language. Um, but objectively speaking, uh, we can identify certain um, elements which make one language harder than the other. Uh, and if we do that, then uh, we can kind of uh, see that Haskell has more concepts or more constructs that are unique. And then they are not sort of as easy as the mainstream kind of uh, languages. But you know, what is mainstream? Like uh, uh, as we were discussing some of the Haskell um, features, they went in to the languages that are sort of um, in the mainstream. So Rust, for example, has many features which are kind of, they used to be unique and tested only in Haskell, but they are kind of uh, flowing in into the other languages. So yeah, it seems like this category is sort of in a blob, blob and then Haskell is kind of sticking out a bit as a, as a hard language. Um, so this is like a, a kind of an opinionated uh, subjective um, ranking. Uh, so Rust is harder than C++, but it's easier than Haskell. And then uh, C and Go are sort of similar, although maybe Go is even easier than C. Um, so yeah, it's very subjective kind of ranking, but it places Rust kind of up there. So Rust is probably um, probably a little bit higher in score than those languages here. Um, all right, so I have some, some jokes um, about like why they have so many keywords for loops uh, <laughs> in, in Rust. So when I was learning Rust initially, I was like, oh my God, why they do the things so complicated, especially if in Golang, they just have one keyword. So all your loops, you can sort out with just the four keyword. Uh, you can express everything. Uh, here you have a lot of them. Uh, so there is a simple, um, you know, um, pattern. Uh, and then there is this, um, this pattern where you want to do something and then check if that condition holds and redo it again, right? So some languages have this, some languages have do, do stuff while, right? You've seen it. Uh, so how would you do that in Rust? Uh, yeah, you can't easily do that in Rust. So you have either an option of an ugly code or you have to repeat the do stuff before your while. And then you, you say do stuff and then while see do stuff again, right? If you want not to repeat do stuff twice, you, you have this kind of an ugliness. Um, so even though they have like gazillion of loops constructs, they kind of missed one. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right. So practical exercises. So let's have a short break. Uh, and then I will talk a little bit about what is expected and what we need to pay attention to. So timer, seven minutes. All right. So let's let's continue. So if you were to take a piece of paper and without no aids, you were to do this, you just do um uh, let's tangle data structure and the method to calculate uh, the area. Would you be able to do it in Haskell and in Rust?
So wrecked. All right, so syntax. We need to remember some syntax. Although if you can carry your paper to the exam, yeah, you may kind of re recall the, the syntax. Um, so tell me what to do. What's the, yeah, first we need the data structure. So data structure to store height and width. Yep. Stupid. Uh... So height, height, and wait with yeah, the copilot is really doing this. Good. Okay. Should it be you or should it be I? Yeah. So it should be you. Why? Exactly. So that would make no sense, right? All right. So the <laughs> copilot kind of suggests the, the implementation of the area function. Uh, should we do it like this or should we do it like a uh, fun? Should we do it like this? So let's have both. What, what's the... What's the difference? Is there a difference? Yeah. Yeah. So what are the advantages, disadvantages of one over the other? Huh? Yeah. So in this particular case, probably this one is more sensible. Uh, and it's also kind of a more collocated. So you have kind of a functions which operate on your rectangle in one place. So you sort of can document it and you can kind of see it more straightforwardly. Where, where would you use this? So, so in this particular case, this probably is a much better choice. Uh, where would you see this? more often or where would you do this instead of this yep exactly so if your function is more generic or it kind of takes more than one type then probably it makes sense you know not to replicate um, that um, functionality all over the multiple places just to have a function which is kind of doing it for on on behalf of different types. Uh, so then it would make sense to have this. All right, so that, that is easy, right? Uh, and the syntax, there is not much to the syntax, is this kind of the arrow for the output type. Uh, and uh, remember that you have to have a reason to use unsigned or signed integers, right? Um, it will come handy later. All right, so when you're doing it, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had the copilot on, uh, but if you had copilot off, you sort of need to remember what you need to remember. So this for the implementation is kind of an important element, right? Um, what if we were to have a set uh, function for, or setting height or set uh, both of them, then we would have to have this mutable access. So here we're getting a reference to to this to to self, uh, but if we are but because we only reading, if we are kind of um, writing, we have to have a mutable. Uh, so, okay, no no mysteries here. Easy. So this this is easy. 
All right. Uh, oh yeah, so it says demo it. Um, demo how to use it. So we probably should also remember how to instantiate it. So how can I instantiate my rect? Okay, Copilot knows what I want, but will that be on the stack or will that be on the heap? If I do what Copilot suggests, on the stack. Everybody understood that? Okay, how do I make it on the heap? So I want to say let rect and I want to have my rectangle on the heap instead. Yep. Can you use mutable? I can do I can do mutable, but it, it would still be um it would still be on so if I say mutable rect, it's still on the if, if I follow this, it's still on the stack. Yep. Huh? No. Okay. To clone it? But clone what? So, so, so do it on the stack and then clone it to get a copy on the heap. No, I want it on the heap. Uh, box. box. So again, uh, if you have to look it up, then you probably, yeah, you probably should not need to look it up, right? Um, so this is this is what you do to have it on the on the heap, and this is uh, exactly the same or uh, similar to C plus plus concept of what would be the equivalent concept in C plus plus unique pointer, right? So I would have. Um, yeah, that, that is not, uh, that. oh, come on. Yeah. Don't show it. Copilot is so annoying. So a box now robs my, um, memory for the rectangle, which is on the heap, and box is on the stack, but the rectangle is on the heap. And the, similarly, if I want, and then if the box goes out of scope here, then my memory will be freed. So with the unique pointer in C++, I will have the same behavior. So I would kind of uh, have a unique pointer, and the moment this unique pointer goes out of scope, the memory will be deallocated and will be cleared, right? Um, what if I were to have it, um, so this is similar to this, um, similar to C++ shared pointer. So if I were to achieve this, what I, yeah, so Copilot is pretty clever. So it says, yep, yeah, use the reference counter. Uh, so it's kind of like box, but it allows me to have uh, multiple pointers to the same um to the same rectangle um yeah whatever so i could uh have um i could pass the previously allocated pointer to here and then have it kind of in in like two pointers pointing to the same memory and then if one of them goes out of scope, it is not cleared until the the last one goes out of scope, right? So, all right. Everybody was using that. Are you familiar with this, with box and RC? Yeah. It's kind of the same as, as in C++. All right. So then next one. So then we have uh, references, we have dereferencing, and we have heap versus stack. Again, I'm not talking about like a super complex um, uh, concepts here, just the basics, right? Uh, if you were to dig deeper, uh, I will also share this later with the, um, <laughs> that's a Rust cheat sheet 
for all the memory uh, concepts of how to reference and dereference things. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but we don't go all the way to all the details, just the, the, the fundamentals, right? A reference to something, dereference, and then box and RC. That's all you need to know to get started. All right, so then uh, we've done our demo using the heap, and now it says, okay, redo it with the uh, with the stack. So that's that's fine. We just don't use the box. We just get the the red stango being here, right? So rect will be um, on the stack. So we have uh, yeah. And then this one is immutable. If we want to be able to mutate it, we have to say mute. And then we can also get the reference to it. So now rect is the reference to something that is on the stack, right? <clears throat> okay, so in this case, um, the pointer to the memory is in the stack, but the actual, um, Red Stango is on the heap and it's only one of it. Uh, same same with this line and same with this line. So normally when we are um, manipulating kind of a data structure, we don't need multiple copies. So the clone concept, um, you have to be quite careful when you use it and why you're using it, right? If you're using it just to get rid of the compiler errors, maybe you're doing something wrong. Maybe you sort of need to think, like, how do I need to achieve what I need to achieve with a single copy? And if I cannot achieve it with a single copy, why? Right? Um, so sometimes we have to have multiple copies, but normally we try to limit. We try not to have multiple copies, right? And if you are passing something to a function, think, like, do I need to pass it by value or just by reference. And most of the time you're just passing it by reference. You don't want to be creating copies. All right. Um, so we've done that, easy. Um, yeah, we, we did that with the pointers on the stack, fine. All right, um, student. So student has name and age, uh, write a function set age. What should be the signature of our function? What's age? Yep. Say, say it again. U8. All right. So we have one proposal. Um, so we have a struct student. And it has uh, name and age. All right. And Copilot suggests U32. So th th there are two questions. Um, first, is it an int? One. Or float? Why would you use a float? And if you were to say, yeah, we only like our um, uh, precision is years. We don't care about months or like uh, fractions of years. Like if someone is 32, we don't care if they are 32.1, right? We just say, yeah, they are 32 years old. So int might be fine. So if the answer is ints are uh, fine, um, U8 versus U32. What should you use? Why? Because nobody gets when the fifteen six years old, and the five years old. Yeah. Good. So it should be U eight. And what? Why is the? What? What's the other reason why we should U eight? So let let's let's use uh U thirty two. Uh, would. So H U8. So if I 
uh, what will be the size of my struct? If I use this line or this line, will there be a difference in the size of my struct or not? Who says yes? Who says no? Why why no is the correct answer? Okay, so if I say uh, ID uh, you eight. So now if I use this line, or this line, would there be a change in the size of the struct? Who says yes? And who says no? There will be a change now, but without this line, they wouldn't. Why? If this line is not there, there is no difference between those two lines. But if this line is here, there is a difference. Why? Exactly because of the data alignment and padding. So even if I use eight, it will be padded to 32 because I cannot just have eight on the 32 bit machine, right? So the, the kind of addresses which are addressable and then 32 is the kind of a space allocation that I can address, uh, which means everything between U8 and U32 is gonna get padded if I'm not using it, right? But you, you should use U8, even if the, it makes no difference to U32, because if later on there is an additional field, then it makes a difference because those two will be actually kind of padded within the same 32-bit um, uh, allocation, right? So the padding will be after them, and the first U8 will be for H, and the second will be for ID, and then two consecutive ones will be padded, padding. Right, yeah. Is it padding the difference of different systems? Yes, so padding will probably depend on the architecture or on the system, uh, but it will always happen, right? So, but you should use the smallest allocation that is required because you don't know what the maintenance will require later on, right? So even though it would not make any difference uh, uh, with our initial use case, uh, whether you use U8 or U32, you should use U8. Uh, that's a that's a good 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 choice. And then you demo it, and then you think what's on the heap and what's on the stack. Why do we why do we do we care so much about heap and the stack? When you're programming in Golang, you don't care. Uh, you don't know actually. Uh, the runtime system will do it for you. Sometimes things will be in the heap. Sometimes things will be on the stack depending like what the compiler and the runtime system decides. Uh, here you do care because you're in control, yeah? Because it's uh, faster to access the stack. Yes, it is faster to access the stack. So if you can get away using the stack, you probably should just use stack, yeah? It's also faster to allocate memory. Yes, it is also faster. So stack is usually better, but sometimes we cannot use stack. Why? So there are kind of two reasons, yeah? Yeah, so size, usually for large data structures, we prefer to have it on the heap uh, and we may actually run out of, of stack. What is the other reason? Uh, the uh, size is unknown. So for example, stream, yeah, the, so there the are three reasons. Yeah, the unknown is very good reason. <laughs> yeah, and what's the, the the last reason? Yeah. You want to pass the object around. Exactly. So the the moment you know uh, we go to this bracket, uh, not this bracket, to to this bracket in a function, everything we have on the stack is gonna disappear. It's gonna get lost, right? So if you need something that persists a bit longer than your function then you need heap, uh, you cannot just use stack. So for long-lived objects or for long-lived things that are passed around or manipulated by multiple functions, you need a heap. Excellent. All right, so then there is a simple vectors. We are using a macro for it, um, no magic here. Uh, will that co code compile?
Yeah, why? That's right. So at this point, we cannot use first because uh, we are kind of locked with the push here, right? So what would be the fix? So the compiler will complain. What would be the fix? Yeah, you need to flip those two lines. So if you do print first and then do vpush, it will compile fine. It will work fine. But with this order, it will not work. Does that make sense? So in here, we are referencing the zeroth element of the of our vector. Our vector is mutable. We are getting a kind of a read-only copy, or we are having a read-only uh, handle to the uh, to the reference of the first value, right? So we're saying, okay, first will be the first element of our vector in this line. And then we saying, okay, now we need to lock V because we are gonna push to it. So we are claiming kind of the, um, the ownership of V for this line of code, which means that line of code lost the the own the ownership the, the lost the ability to kind of read the from that from that vector so in this line this is invalid because it has been invalidated by this line which kind of claimed the ownership of the variable of that of that memory space yeah so if i get it uh correctly so first go then just point to not to no, it's not allowed. It will be kind of uh, the, the behavior is undefined and the compiler will not allow you to have it. So in this particular case, if the V has not been reallocated, uh, it will actually not change anything um, because we didn't manipulate it the, the first, but we don't know if the vector is sitting in the same memory space or it has been moved somewhere else by because you know it, it it is a dynamic object, right? Um, yeah. It's because we lose it when we reach the v dot two. So the ownership is taken over by this method, but but by this function, yes, yes, exactly. So the ownership kind of is passed to this function via the self kind of mechanism, right? So this is a method. This method is being passed. Uh, a, a, a version of the V and then does something to it. Um, so the ownership is kind of now in this function. So the deadline lost it. Yep. So that means we can't, uh, let's say we want to print directly from the V variable, we can't do that after, uh, let's say instead of printing first, we cannot print V either. We can, because after this function um, kind of finished, V can be claimed by another function. So if we kind of use V here instead of first, that would work because it's a kind of a new V, so to speak. Okay. Because nobody yeah. holds the owner ownership at that moment. It's kind of a there. V is kind of for grabs. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You could go ahead and do another push to V after the print line, right? Because the ownership could be given away then? Yes, you can. Yeah. Your question? Yeah, so if, if we change this line of code to access v, V0, uh, reference to V0, then it will work. Uh, but because we're using this, handle, that handle is invalidated. So there are two possible fixes. Like one fix is to move this line to be first and then do V, or as you say, don't use first, but use the V directly here. After this line, we can do things with V again. So because V is not kind of um, owned by anybody, we can kind of acclaim V or do something with V. So we can have another push if we want to. So this is counterintuitive, right? So it is kind of unique to, to Rust, uh, this owner ownership 
uh, passing and the concept of ownership of the of the variable, like variable owning certain memory. And then at some point it becomes invalidated by the compiler and the compiler prohibits you doing things, right? In C++, that would work fine. It the compiler would not complain, right? Uh, but in here, the compiler will complain and then you have to uh, make the compiler happy uh, by either re re reorganizing the code or using the V directly here. Yeah. So conceptually, this is very similar to unique pointers, uh, but um, in because they will be, get, go, go out of scope and be kind of cleaned up on the end of your scope, right? Uh, so to, I, I will show you also there is a, um, so sometimes, so yeah, let's do this vector thing. So we have uh, let V equals back. It doesn't matter. Okay, and then, um, we have a print line. So we accessing V here and we want to have the first, that first. No, I don't want to do get here. I want to do this access. Okay, so also, um, what's the difference between doing this and doing uh, first equals uh, v get zero? Yeah, so what's the difference between those two? Yep. So if we go Rust vector get standard vector. Uh, get 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 so get has this signature i where is my get it returns an option to a reference. So it can return none, right? So the difference between these two is if you sure the index exists, you can use the index directly like uh, I'm doing here, because if you use an index which is out of range, uh, then the program will crash. Whereas, so in this case, if I say get four, in this case, it will work, nothing will crash, and the first will be none. In this case, the program will panic, right? So you have this kind of a control mechanism or doing a safe safe access to something which you are not sure about the size, and then you have kind of an unsafe access to something that you are risking a program panicking if you're outside of the range of your, of your vector. So in both cases you're gonna get the reference but in this case you're gonna get the reference wrapped inside um, a, an option and in this case you're gonna get the reference directly right okay so then uh, what i wanted to say is that you we have this code so we have a first we have the um v push uh four and then we have the print line with the first. 
So now first is out of um, out of access because this kind of claimed the ownership. So now um, this references to requires the ownership, but it lost this ownership because of this line. And then this will not work. Um, you can uh, move this. So you can move, um, oops. You can move it here and it will work. And you can even, um, and sometimes you see that in, in Rust code, you can kind of uh, put it into a scope. And then um, first will go out of scope at this bracket. So even though it is sort of uh, uh, declared here, uh, at that point, there is no first anymore, right? Uh, because we sort of make made it scoped just for that for that place. Uh, sometimes we do this trick with mutexes or something that we want to for sure go out of scope at, at the point where we want and then we are doing something else afterwards, right? So normally if I don't do those brackets, of course, uh, first we'll be hanging around until this bracket, right? So first we'll be in scope until this bracket, but sometimes uh, we want to enforce kind of a going out of scope and we can kind of uh, just introduce artificially additional brackets. Uh, you do that trick also in Java sometimes when you want to have a mutex controlling a kind of a block of code uh, and you kind of uh, enclose it. You say, um, this, this this block of code is only available if the, if I get handle, like if I got the mutex, um, access to the mutex, right? And Java has this kind of as a syntax. Uh, and then once you finish at that bracket, everything is gonna be cleaned up. All right. Um, so this one is a hard one. We may go back to this kind of a ownership model, but I'm sure you have been discussing it with your compiler a lot <laughs> when you're doing Rust labs. Um, the, the compiler complains that you sort of are uh, having handle to something you're not supposed to have. All right, this one is an interesting one. Um, so we have... Um, uh, a, a vector or a file, and the first number is the one which you need to count how many are in the in the sequence, right? Can you do that? Like, what would you do to do it? Can you solve it in your head? Like, how how you want it to be programmed? How many passes over data do you need? One. And will it will it make a difference if you're doing the pass from the beginning or from the end? Well, obviously you should start from the beginning because the number you're gonna count is at the the first element, right? Um, so you should go left to right. Um, should you use loops? Yeah, you could. Should you use iterators? You could. So there are different ways. Do you know how to do it? Like in your head or do you need Copilot to do it? Yeah. Yeah. So how, how like what's the, the most concise way of expressing this problem? What, what's the kind of the keyword which like uh, shows up in your head immediately? Yes, <laughs> filter, right? That's all you need. You just need to read the first element and then do filter. And that's that's it, right? All right. So uh, similar, kind of a sum of squared odd numbers. Okay, if you're thinking about loops, then yeah, you can use loops. Same as with this one, you can use do loops, you could, but you probably shouldn't. You probably should use filter. And uh, most languages have filter, and that's probably the, the best tool for the job. Uh, this one, sum of squared odd numbers, yeah, similar problem. Probably you should use filter, and probably you should use a map and kind of and the sum at the end, right? 
Um, all right, so there is a kind of a similar problem. So you have a bunch of kids. They went for a treasure hunt. They all collected sweets. Uh, and some of them, you know, uh, collected some number, like maybe some collected two, some collected 12, some collected 15. One of the kids collected the most, right? But you want to give all of the kids uh, the same number of sweets. So you just need to calculate the sum of the difference between the kids collected sweets and the max. You get the problem? All right, so again, what would you do? What would you do to solve this problem? But what, like, say it again? Like, how would you? Yeah, so you can uh, solve it analytically by multiplying the hit with the maximum number of suites with the number of kids and then uh, summing all the kids uh, sweets and doing the difference. You could do that. So that would probably be the, uh, uh, the easiest way to solve it, right? It requires a single pass of over data to identify what is the sum of all the kids sweets and who is the max, what is the max, right? and then do a kind of the calculations. Good. So then there is one more. Um, is that uh, a reasonable candidate signature for our method? Yeah. Definitely. So unsigned is definitely better than signed. <laughs> Why would you use negative numbers, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, should should you use uh, U16? I mean, reasonably, the kid's probably not going to go over, you know, uh, 4 billion suites. Uh, so do we need U32 here? Yeah, so in this particular case, the reasonable number is probably U4 or U8, uh, depending like how many suites you have distributed. How U8 is how many suites per, per kit? What's the limit on, on U8? 255, right? It is possible that, you know, that may not be enough, right? <laughs> Probably unlikely, but possible. So then we can go to U16, okay? U16 is, how big is, is the U16? 65,000, okay, definitely the, the, the good number, right? So then we have a choice of U16 and U32. On a 32-bit uh, platform, there is actually no difference in memory uh, usage between those two. There is no difference because for U16, I will have to use U32 to pass it around anyway, right? So for this particular case, probably U32 is fine. Um, unless you want to signal that, you know, the, the number of suites is of certain limit, right? Uh, so in this particular case, I probably would use U32 instead of U16 uh, because it makes actually completely no difference whatsoever for the compiled uh, binary. Um, but yeah, it depends. Like maybe you can um, use U16 just to highlight what is the expected highest, highest number. Do, do we need, okay, so you need to um, join. Do we need an iterator to solve that problem?
yes, we can use iterator, but do we have to use an iterator? No. We can use like an old fashioned loop uh, instead, uh, go over. Um, all right, but should we use an iterator? Everybody answered? Because the Mentimeter has some bugs. Let me do a quick. Yes, we should. That would be the correct, like the proper way of doing it, right? You should not use a, a loop for it. Um, you should use an iterator. Uh, so what would you use? Would you use um, fault? Uh, you could use something else, or you could use map and sum. Uh, so max is a very useful. Uh, you can use map and sum together, or you could use fold instead of map and sum. Uh, I could not solve it, so you can say that, or you could use something else. Yeah, very nice. So um, I actually, I I don't know what I would do. I probably would use fault uh, because I also like faults, but I was thinking about it. And actually, if you, if you solve it by doing max and map, then the map part can be parallelized. Uh, and then the sum is like uh, uh, reduce. So you have kind of a map reduce pattern, right? Uh, if you're doing a fold, you kind of, uh, having everything done in kind of a single pass and you're doing kind of just one thing and you cannot really parallelize fold, uh, but you can parallelize the map. So I was thinking for a very large kids, you know, bounty hunt, uh, would that make sense to have that first part being able to parallelize it and do the partial uh, kind of processing such that it would be more efficient, but I don't know. And also in Rust, it doesn't matter because Rust doesn't parallelize anything uh, automatically, you have to do it manually. So then, you know, both of those are perfectly fine. All right, so this one is the last one. It's a little bit more involved. So we have two lists and then we were to remove elements from the second list from the first list. Uh, again, same questions. Would you use for loops? Uh, if you had to, you could, then you would have kind of a one outer loop and one inner loop for the second parameter, uh, but you probably should not use loops. You probably should use iterators and you probably should use just a single pass checking if the elements are inside this set, which means you probably should just use filter. And then that's the simplest way of solving it, right? Uh, so there are some things that kind of uh, look really complex if you try to solve them by brute force using kind of um, for loops, uh, but they become kind of trivial if you have a concept of con con something containing something in, in a set or in a kind of collection and kind of a filter. And then it's uh, like super trivial, right? So it's a one liner with a filter and uh, you know an element of kind of check, right? Um, do you remember what is the uh, function which checks if something is an element of a vector in Rust? Yeah. Yeah. How about uh, Haskell? It's for file and load. <laughs> in? <laughs> so you have a function which kind of uh, checks the, you know, um, membership. All right, so that was kind of a quick uh, run through. Um, I will really quickly um, go over some things that are kind of interesting. So the interesting thing is the enum. Uh, and enum is not your typical um, uh, C++ enum. Java also has enums which are also not the same as C++ enums, but they are kind of also not the same as the Rust enums. All three languages, they use the concept of enum and it means completely different things, right? It's a bit of a mess. Like they, they probably, we should probably have just one name for each of those use cases, uh, but they are kind of, um, 
Yeah, tuples are interesting also in Rust. Um, so you have type aliases, same as in Haskell. That's super easy. Uh, the basic types, uh, there is nothing unusual here. Uh, what is a little bit unusual is the, the distinction between the string slice and the string. And that makes kind of uh, make sense for Rust because of the memory management, right? Uh, with web assembly, as you've learned, you don't even have that. You, you know, uh, modeling all strings as just arrays of bytes. Uh, here, uh, literals are um, the string slices, and then the kind of the object um, for being able to manipulate the string is kind of a string um, string type. Um, tuples, uh, you know, integer and a string slice or unit uh, unit tuple. Sometimes we're returning kind of an empty thing. It's it's the same as with um, with Haskell. Um, so you have kind of a unit structs um, for for type singletons, uh, and then uh, we have the field structs and the tuple structs. So the uh, field struct has uh, is like a normal struct which has names like what we did for its tangle. Uh, if we deleted the names of the red stangle um, uh, width and, and height, we can reference them by zero and one. Uh, and then we basically have the same as the as the tuple, right? Um, so we have uh, a point. So it has X and Y as names. But if we uh, say uh, tuple point zero and one, this line of code is exactly the same as this one because uh, the instances of tuple point here will have uh, fields which are called zero and one, and this will be zero and this will be one, right? Uh, so it's kind of like a syntactic uh, gimmick uh, that allows you to sort of uh, address the kind of uh, elements of the of the tuple by by index zero, one, two, and so on. Uh, but if you want the name, you you use this. So you have kind of a named uh, attributes. Uh, struct, same syntax, same everything. And then you control the memory alignment. So memory alignment is something that um, we talked. Uh, so here we have, yeah, we've done this uh, as an example. So a memory alignment is how different size of objects can be stored in memory. So not everything can be stored everywhere. Uh, certain smaller things can be only stored on the memory addressable uh, boundaries. And then the rest is filled up with padding. Uh, and in uh, Rust, this padding is kind of controlled by the, um, yeah, by the programmer. Arrays, again, nothing unusual. Uh, the type and the length. So this is like a, a, a literal of an of a array. And here we're saying there is an array type which holds uh, unsigned integers and the size is 10. And then you can initialize it uh, either by this kind of a default default initialization, or you can say uh, initialize it with 10 values of one. So then this is again the size and this is the value that's supposed to be initialized. So the first element is either type or the kind of a literal. And then the second is the size. Um, nothing unusual there. Uh, functions we do with fn, and then we have closures and higher order functions. Um, I already told you about this. Uh, they is a little bit unfortunate that they named the anonymous functions closures in Rust. Uh, that that's the word they use. Um, so yeah, we are going a little bit over time, um, but I will finish finish uh, in like two minutes with the closures. So. Are closures and anonymous functions the same thing? Okay, everybody did that. They are not the same things, and it doesn't depend. So closure has a very well-defined uh, term in computer science, uh, which the next slide will uh, will tell you. So. So they are not the same. 
Is anonymous function a function without a name? Okay, let's check. Yes, of course. Anonymous function is just a function that doesn't have a name. Um, so then, what is a closure? Closure is a function that captures something from its outer context. Yes, that's what closures are. So closures are functions that have captured something from the out from from where they are. Um, and that is definition which holds in any programming language. Uh, but you have those rust closures, and rust closures um, not necessarily need to be closures. They may be an anonymous function that don't capture anything from the outside environment, right? Um, does closure must be an anonymous function? No, they can be named. I can have a named function which captures something from outside environment and it's still a closure. Um, so then there is a homework for you to do to write um, uh, let me just go to the homework. <laughs> right, an example of anonymous and named closures in Golang and Haskell, right? You can do that. So in Golang and Haskell, you can do that. In, um, in Rust, they um, made a choice that named functions cannot be uh, closures. So yeah, I, I spoil it here. The, the answer is true. <laughs> And that's the limitation of the language. And it is also kind of annoying uh, if you're coming from like uh, Golang or Haskell, uh, because there is no reason why not. Um, anyway, um, I will not run more quizzes. Uh, I just finish here. So why? Why they have it kind of a kind of a complex? So I don't like it. I kind of hate Rust for it, but why? Yeah. No, there is a better reason. So it's not like there, there is a valid reason why they have it complexity like this and why the default name for uh, anonymous function is a closure. The reason is memory management. So Haskell and Golang, they you as a programmer don't care about the memory management. The runtime system takes care of it for you. Here you do. So every time you have a closure or every time you have an anonymous function, somebody needs to take care of the memory management of possible uh, access to the outside world out of your context. So thinking about all anonymous functions as closures kind of makes sense because you as a programmer have to be very careful of what you're taking out from the outer context or not. If you're not taking anything, then it's just a normal anonymous function that you don't have to do much magic with. But the default of thinking about it is kind of, it kind of makes sense in the context of Rust. Uh, because you as a programmer have to think what will you take ownership of from the outside context, right? Uh, so the non-taking anything is a kind of an extra case, which is a kind of an easy case to handle. All the other cases are kind of complicated. So that's why probably they, they named anonymous functions closures such that to highlight that you have to think about it, right? If it is a closure, right? Yeah, all right, so we will finish here. Uh, and then I will see you guys uh, at two o'clock for the labs. Thank you.